Hi everybody and welcome to episode 4 of This Week in Street, where I break down the top street photography and related stories from across the net, plus anything else interesting I find along the way. I was off last week and there's tons to cover, so let's jump right into it, shall we? We start this week's show on a sad note. On April 25th, the photo world lost legendary Magnum photographer Abbas at the age of 74. Abbas joined Magnum in 1981 and became a full member in 1985. He worked as a photojournalist in the era before 24-hour news channels when embedded photographers were often the only way for people to see the real human suffering of conflict around the world. Abbas was a true master of the photo story and believed there were two approaches to photography. In his own words, the school of Henri Cartier-Bresson, they draw with light, they sketch with light, the single picture is paramount for them. For me, that was never the point. My pictures are always part of a series, an essay. Each picture should be good enough to stand on its own, but its value is part of something larger. Abbas dedicated his career to documenting the wars, disasters, and belief systems of the world. He was a self-described historian of the present, and he created many iconic images along the way. It's with great sadness that we say goodbye to this legendary photographer. Street photography has its roots firmly planted in the tradition of documentary and photojournalism. And while documentary photography often sidesteps the wit and casual sense of humor of street photography, the best documentary and street photos share the same spirit of candid investigation. The beautiful images that Abbas was able to create in the throes of chaos are an achievement that most of us could only dream of on our best days. Do yourself a favor, go to Abbas's Magnum page and just look at his catalog. This is a man who devoted his life to creating images that shone with truth and insight into the human condition. And I can think of no better tribute than to simply appreciate what he's done. He was a modern master and he will be missed, but his legacy will live on for generations. All right, switching gears. New York City Parks employee finds 3,000 color slides from 1978. Well, it's not another Vivian Meyer story, but it's still a nifty treasure trove of images that haven't been seen in over 40 years. Here's the deal. Back in 1978, a press corps strike left a lot of New York City photographers out of work. The Parks Commission at the time hired eight temporarily unemployed New York Times photographers to document the city's parks. And these photos were recently discovered while cleaning out an office. The photos haven't been seen in 40 years. The images are kind of an unfiltered time capsule of an era that is lost to us. There are no cell phones. People are actually talking to each other, enjoying social time with each other, rather than wrapping themselves in a cocoon of technology. But it's also strikingly good photography. I mean, apart from the hairdos and the fashion, any of these photos could stand on their own as street photos taken in the last week. Proving yet again that good photography stands the test time and this is some good photography. 65 of these images have been curated into a show that's on display from May 3rd to June 14th at the Arsenal Gallery in Central Park. And there's a great slideshow of these images on the New York Times website. Link to that's in the description. Definitely worth a look. Ah, and speaking of slides, can we talk about that super weird death scene in the Kodachrome movie? It's the Kodachrome movie I talked about a couple weeks ago. It's a touching story of a man reconnecting with his dying father as they embark on a road trip to take his father's last rolls of Kodachrome film to the lab for development. I watched it and it was great. I liked it a lot. Jason Sudeikis was amazing in it. Who knew he could act? Everything came together nicely. It's a touching story. I think a lot of photographers are going to like it and regular folks are going to like it too. There's something in it for everyone. I laughed, I cried. It was everything. But there's one thing that sticks out for me. The death scene. Now listen, he's going on a road trip with his dying father. I don't think this is a spoiler alert. This is Chekhov's gun. His father's going to die during the movie. And he does. And when he dies, they've... Okay, here's the story. Kodak discontinued the dyes required to develop Kodachrome film. So the last rolls of Kodachrome film, the last lab in the world that processed Kodachrome film was in Parsons, Kansas. And the last rolls were set to be developed on a certain day. That's why they're racing on this road trip to get his father's film there just in time. So they show up, he gets the film into the lab on time. And of course the city's filled with all the most famous photographers in the world. They even name drop Steve McCurry. I guess this was done before all the whole thing came out with him. But you get the sense right away, all these photographers recognize Jason Stake as his father. And it's a great way for his character to see that his father was loved in another world that he didn't know existed. It was a way to sort of tie the whole film together. Yeah, all right, the father dies. And as they're wheeling him out to the coroner's van, all the photographers that are in town line the hallway and point their cameras at the sky and fire their flashes as the body wheels past them in the like, who dreamt up this 21 flash gun salute? I mean, I've been a photographer for almost 35 years now. I've never heard of this. Anyhow, I had to bring it up. Movie's still worth watching. Totally worth it. It's currently running on Netflix. Links in the description. And what do we got next? Gustavo Minos joins Burn My Eye. Wow, this is uh, huge. Gustavo's a Brasilia-based photographer that's been shooting since 2009. When he enrolled in a year-long course with acclaimed photographer Carlos Moreira, the course was based on photographers who used photography as a means of self-expression. Robert Frank, Friedlander, Eggleston, and Harry Gruyard. Right, Harry Gruyard. 
It's one of Gustavo's main influences. I just don't know how to pronounce his name. Anyways, a lot of these photographers worked on the street and this inspired Gustavo to hit the streets of his city. And his work is out of this world. It's so good. His images are complex and layered, both in terms of composition and meaning. But unlike photographers like Alex Webb, who have an almost mathematical precision to their images, Gustavo's work is almost conversational. There's an ease and clarity to his vision that's supernaturally beautiful in its stark simplicity. I was surprised that I liked the work as much as I did. This is a fresh new voice in street photography and it's great to see him as part of Burn My Eye. Yeah, 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 I know. Photographers join collectives and leave collectives all the time. This is one you want to have a look at. There's some seriously good work here and if this is the direction the street photography is going in, I want to be part of it because it's beautiful. You can check out Gustavo's portfolio on Burn My Eye and the link to that is in the description. Oh, we got a couple of rumors to cover. First up, Zeiss to launch 35 millimeter F1.8 FE pancake lens. According to Sony Alpha rumors, Zeiss is developing a series of compact pancake lenses for Sony's full frame Alpha series of cameras. The first is going to be a 35 millimeter F1.8 FE pancake. Yeah, yeah, another lens. Why is this interesting? Well, because the future. According to the rumor mill, these new lenses will have several elements made from aluminum oxynitride. Aluminum what's a who now? According to surmet.com, Alon, or aluminum oxynitride is an amazing and unique transparent advanced ceramic that is polycrystalline made from powder with a cubic spindle structure. In the popular media, it's commonly referred to as transparent aluminum. What the Star Trek four? Hello computer. The new material reportedly has far less weight and thickness than normal glass with excellent optical transmission and clarity plus outstanding hardness and scratch resistance. So yeah, perfect material for lenses from the future. Even if these lenses don't come out with the super futuristic Star Trek transparent aluminum glass in them, a compact 35 millimeter pancake is exactly what a lot of street photographers who use the Sony system are looking for. The current 35 millimeter F2.8 Sony Zeiss lens is fine. It maybe it lacks a little character, but it's fine. The Zeiss Loxia lenses are okay, I guess. They're really expensive and they have some problems with ergonomics. The image quality is not horrible, but nah, they're not really exciting a lot of street guys at this point. So there's room in the Sony Alpha system for a line of pancake lenses. There's no word as to whether these will be manual or autofocus when they finally do come out. This street photographer is praying for manual focus, but whatever, I'm interested to see. I want, I want a transparent aluminum lens. That's what I want. I didn't even know it existed and now it's all I want. Thank you Zeiss. Thank you Rumor Mill. And now I've Spread the joy to you. More info can be found over at SonyAlphaRumors.com. Link is in the description. All right, one more rumor. This one can be filed under Why Fuji Why. Apparently Fuji has a brown version of the X100F waiting in the wings. Yeah, a brown one. Not the graphite one that we'd all gobble up. You remember the graphite X-Pro2? Imagine an X100 in that color. I'd totally get five. I would get six. Nope, not that. Not even a glossy black one. This is a plain old silver X100F with brown leatherette on it and it's butt ugly. Now listen, this is wild speculation at this point. There's been rumors of a brown X100F for months now. And you know, frankly, Fuji typically releases variants on the X100 about halfway through its life cycle. It seems to be on a two year refresh. So right now is about the time when a new one would come out. There's no official word from Fuji on this one, but a blog post by Ivan Joshua Lowe has fueled the speculation once again. He's got an entire photo spread of an X100F with brown leatherette on it that appears to be actual product shots of the camera. Hey, Fuji does this. They'll send out cameras to photographers and let them do the shots that they're gonna use when the thing actually launches. No one knows. If he did, he's vi if, if these are the actual shots that he took with that kind of camera, this guy's violating all his NDA agreements for no reason. I hope this isn't real because I hate the way it looks. Yeah, maybe if it comes out, it'll look better in person than it does in these pictures. But I mean, look at this. Ugh. Not my favorite at all. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see what happens. Hopefully it won't be quite as ugly in person because it's butt ugly in these pics. All right, that's it for this week's episode of This Week in Street, the weekly show where I run down the top street photography and related stories from around the net, plus anything else interesting I find along the way. It's not always gonna be a story that's about street photography, but if it's something that I think might be interesting for street photographers, I'm gonna cover it here. If you got an idea for a story, shoot me a message, let me know what it is. As always, if you like this episode, hit that like button and don't forget to subscribe. But for now, I'm Carl from Street Shooter and that's enough of me. Now get out there and take some pictures already. Just not with the bud ugly brown X100F. It's gonna haunt me.